it's really dramatic how much this field has changed. But now that we're coming on the 20th anniversary of the field, uh, I've been reflecting on how this field actually circles all the way back around to the origin of science. So you go back 500 years ago, and uh, it's, it's hard to imagine what an incredibly different world this is. Uh, people have much shorter life expectancies. Uh, there's no TV or radio. The kids here probably can't even imagine that. Uh, and uh, of course, most people are illiterate. Um, they literally just have no clue what's going on, but like people at, at all times, they have this huge desire to at least have the pretense that they have an understanding of what's going on. The one thing that they had, though, that a lot of us who live in cities don't have is they had beautiful skies. Even in cities, there were no lights back then, and there, there weren't giant factories spewing out stuff. Uh, and you could look up and you could see the stars. And they provided a sense of regularity in people's lives. They rose in the east, they sat in the west. Uh, they had a fixed pattern. They didn't appear to move against each other. So this, of course, became the basis of the first cosmology, uh, the notion that since everything appears to be moving around us and we don't seem to be moving relative to ourselves, we're the center, and this stuff is all in a giant sphere around us, moving in this nice, regular, even uh, way. And furthermore, this is a really comforting idea uh, because it makes us the center of the universe. And most people are living day to day. Their main worry is about what their next meal is going to be. And so in that circumstance, having this notion that, that you're the center of the universe, you're in this special place, uh, would, would be greatly comforting. So one of the main problems are these pesky planets. Uh, the planets move relative to the stars, but if they all moved in the same direction all the time, that would be no problem. You just put them on slightly smaller spheres and just let them circle around the sun. But in reality, what happens is, if you look at Mars, uh, every two years or so, there'll be a period of several weeks where Mars appears to go backward relative to the background stars. So if everything is going in nice, simple circles around the Earth, this makes absolutely no sense. And this was a major bug uh, in the cosmology of, of the pre-scientific world. And uh, the main theory that was cooked up to deal with it uh, is called epicycles, where instead of the planet traveling in a circle around the Earth, the planet travels in a circle that travels on a circle around the Earth. And by doing that, you can make this planet trace backward paths. The problem is that if you measure, for instance, Mars accurately enough, and you've got this little epicycle, it doesn't quite match the orbit. So uh, what people did was they added more and more epicycles. So then, instead of the planet being on this circle, on this circle, they would put another circle here, and then the planet would be on that circle, going around this circle, going around this circle. And they added more and more circles to try to get the fit better. And if you add, as any scientist knows, you add enough free parameters, you can fit anything. Uh, by the time this whole system collapsed, uh, Mars had as many as 56 epicycles. So computationally, this was really incredible, especially in a pre-computer age. So uh, the guy who gets credit uh, for moving the field forward is this guy Copernicus, uh, who in the early 1500s uh, starts working on this idea that, hey, maybe the Earth isn't the center, maybe the Sun is the center. And he moves the Earth out, going around the Sun, just like all the other planets. So this is a really wild idea. Um, and uh, it's so wild that, in fact, if you think about it, Copernicus should get credit for discovering the first planet. He discovered Earth. Because prior to this, Earth wasn't a planet. It was the center of the universe. So the nifty thing about Copernicus's idea is that uh, you can naturally explain this backward motion of planets uh, simply because we're on a moving platform. So every two years or so, the Earth catches up to Mars. And as we pass Mars, Mars appears to go backward. Just as if you've got two cars that are going forward, and you're a passenger in the car going faster, if you look out at the other car, it'll appear to go backwards, even though you're both going forward, simply because you're on a moving platform. So this is nifty. Uh, but in fact, if you plot the data carefully and you match up Mars, it still doesn't do a great job. Computationally, it's much more simple, but it still maintains a lot of the aspects of the previous system. In particular, everything is moving in circular orbits because it's in the heavens and everything in the heavens are perfect. So the, the next really interesting character 
uh, in all of this is this uh, Italian monk, uh, Giordano Bruno. Uh, and so he, uh, he's sort of the biggest rabble rouser of the age. And in 1584, he follows up on the ideas of Copernicus, and he writes, there are countless suns and countless earths all rotating around their suns in exactly the same way as the seven planets of our system. The countless worlds in the universe are no worse and no less inhabited than our Earth. So, I mean, today that's like ho-hum, right? That's the basis of every episode of Star, Wa Star Trek and Star Wars that's ever been shown, right? But Do you really use rotating? Well, it's translated from the Italian, so uh. you, you'll have to. <laughs> so, you know, the, we're going back to Copernicus. His book that, uh, that comes out that says, you, you know, the sun is the center is called Of Revolutions. And at that time, revolution simply meant to go around. But the idea was so wild that we now associate revolution with violent overthrow. And it literally comes out of, uh, out of this uh, history. So um, what Bruno is saying here is, is a step too far. Um, uh, at least if the Earth is going around the sun and the sun is the center of the universe, all right, then we're, we're still in a kind of a special place. But if every star is a sun and every star has planets and other planets have people, then then we're just nothing. We're just one of gazillions of things out there. And uh, w when you step out this far, uh, you sort of move into the process of being a heretic. And uh, I've always said it's better to be an infidel than a heretic. Uh, and we all know how things ended up for Bruno. <laughs> so the, uh, the really critical transitional character in the uh, invention of modern science, and modern science is only 400 years old, it's kind of spectacular when you think about it, is this guy Kepler. Uh, Kepler manages to get a hold of the most accurate observations ever made of Mars. A guy named Tycho uh, had made these in the 1580s. Uh, and uh, Tycho was really conscious, not just of very accurately plotting the positions of Mars, but noting what his errors were. And he worked very hard to estimate what his measurement errors were. So starting around 1600, Kepler works incredibly hard to put together a mathematical model which exactly tracks the positions within the measurement errors. And this is really where science begins. Uh, you've got your math, your theory has to match your observations, and you are critically aware of measurement error. Um, so uh, Kepler solves the problem. We call the motions of planets, we call them Kepler's laws, and they apply to the planets in our own solar system, and they apply to extrasolar planets as well. And there's three laws of planetary motion, and I won't, I won't bother going into detail, uh, unless you all want a pop quiz at the end of this. Um, but the first law is really the most wild one, and it really is it's maybe more wild than Copernicus's idea. He says, planets don't travel in circles. They travel in ellipses. Now you've got things in the heavens moving that aren't in these perfect circles. And this was really mind-blowing. And if more people could have read back then, they would have been really, really angry. Um, it takes Kepler about 20 years to actually put together these three laws of planetary motion. Uh, he's working by himself. He doesn't have any mathematical assistance. Uh, he has no computers, of course. Uh, he works out model after model after model. When the models do not fit the observations without measurement error, he throws them away, just over and over again. <laughs> really a spectacular feat. And uh, in the context of his own life and times, uh, it's maybe even more spectacular when you consider that he was stopped for several years in this process because he had to defend his mother from a charge of witchcraft. Uh, fortunately, she was found not guilty. So. Uh, very early on uh, in, in the history of science, people are incredibly interested in the possibility of extrasolar planets. So it's you know, 1610, 1620, the telescope has literally just been invented. And people immediately turn their telescope and they think, okay, I'll look at a nearby star, maybe I'll see the teeny tiny little planet next to it. So that really didn't work out too well. The problem is planets only shine by reflected light. Uh, even a giant planet like Jupiter is a billion times fainter than the sun. And trying to pick out a, a planet next to a star is like trying to pick out a firefly next to a thermonuclear blast. You just you can't see it. It's overwhelmed. So starting about 100 years ago, uh, the first real serious efforts to find extrasolar planets began. 
and it's a technique called astrometry. And in astrometry, you don't detect the planet itself. You detect the effect the planet has on the star. So as the planet orbits the star, it kicks the star into a small counter orbit. This is just Newton's third law. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. And so the hope is that if you look at the star over many, many years, you'll see it wobbling versus background stars. So this is a very difficult thing to do. And you know, starting 100 years ago, people would literally spend decades of their entire life taking photographs of a, of a given nearby star and then tracking it very carefully on these photographic plates. Uh, and back in the 60s and 70s, you might have heard that uh, Peter Van de Kamp uh, found planets around Barnard's star. Unfortunately, they didn't pan out. Uh, in fact, in this field up until 20 years ago, every few years somebody would announce that they had discovered the first planet ever, and the one thing they had, all had in common was that they were all wrong. So we do have the advantage of a lot of modern new technology uh, today. And in fact, uh, Alan Boss on our own campus uh, is leading a, a renewed effort to use astrometry to find planets around nearby stars. Uh, Alan is actually one of the founders of the whole field of extrasolar planets. He's been involved uh, in high-level discussions with NASA and NSF going back since before extrasolar planets to help set the field in place. And he's also written a couple of really nice books uh, outlining the history of extrasolar planets. The technique that finally uh, broke the problem uh, is uh, called the Doppler shift or the Doppler wobble technique. Uh, this is uh, similar to the astrometry idea. You don't see the planet itself. The planet orbits the star. It kicks the star into a small counter orbit. Uh, so what you're trying to do is detect the motion of the star and thereby infer the presence of the planet and hopefully be able to work out the orbital parameters and the mass of the planet. So as the star is kicked into this counter orbit, half of the time the star will be approaching an observer on Earth. And the light emitted from the star will be uh, moved, they'll be shoved to shorter wavelengths. That's the Doppler shift. In astronomy lingo, if you move something to shorter wavelengths, you blue shift it. Then for the other half of the orbit, the star is receding from an observer on Earth, and the light gets stretched out or red shifted in the lingo of astronomy. So uh, people have been aware that this is a possibility that you could do for even 100 years now. The problem has been measurement precision. Basically, from the 1920s into the 1980s, uh, people could measure these Doppler shifts to about plus or minus 300 meters a second. Unfortunately, Jupiter kicks the sun uh, by about 10 meters a second. So the errors dwarf the actual measurement you were trying to make. And that's what, uh, in fact, we were working on for the eight years before planets were discovered, was a technique to beat measurement errors down to the point where you could hope to make this detection. So the instrumental heart of, of what we do is a, a shell spectrometer that for us, when you're doing spectroscopy, the telescope is just a light bucket. It just gathers light. And it brings the light to a focus. And at the focus, there's an entrance slit to the spectrometer. And then the light begins diverging. It goes off of a collimating mirror. It's just a parabolic mirror that takes this diverging beam and turns it into a parallel beam, reflects off of an a shell grating which is basically the same as a prism. It simply separates the light out into its component colors. Then it goes through across dispersing prisms and on into a camera. And finally, it's focused onto a CCD, a charge couple device. This is the same electronic detector that's in all of your portable cameras and in your cell phones, except that astronomical CCDs cost $100,000 and have to be kept on liquid nitrogen. This is what a resulting spectrum looks like. Um, in the old days in astronomy, uh, if you took a spectrum, you either could take a teeny tiny bit of spectrum at high resolution, or you could take the entire spectrum at low resolution. What these shells allow you to do is both. So they, they take the uh, spectrum. Each one of these stripes of light is uh, about a 50 angstroms of spectrum. The human eye sees from at the blue end about 4,000 angstroms to the red end about 7,000 angstroms. So it's about 3,000 angstroms we can see. The shell stacks it all into a single CCD chip. So it's about 50 angstroms in each stripe. And you can imagine going along the black there and cutting it out and taping it to the one below it and then cutting it out and taping it to the one below it so you'd have one long continuous spectrum. Unfortunately, uh, 
there's not enough money in the world to build CCDs that long. And what the shells do is they stack the spectrum so it'll fit on a CCD. Uh, then you'll notice within any one of these uh, stripes of light, there are these black lines. Those black lines are due to atoms and molecules in the atmosphere of the star. As the light leaves the star, it goes through the rarefied atmosphere, and light gets absorbed at specific wavelengths by atoms and molecules. So you can actually look at the spectrum and figure out what the star is made out of. For instance, for the experts here, uh, this is the famous hydrogen alpha line. Uh, this is the famous sodium doublet. Most of these lines are um, iron and nickel and calcium and all the other stuff in a star. So it's pretty remarkable. Something can be like hundreds or thousands of light years away and you know what it's made of. But it turns out for us in the, in the precision Doppler field, we don't care about any of that. All these, all these absorption lines are, are for us are is wavelength markers. And what we're trying to do is see them shift back and forth. So if the star is approaching us, these lines will shift to the left. If, they're receding from, if the stars are receding from us, they'll shift to the right. And uh, it's uh, very painstaking and computer intensive to measure these teeny tiny little shifts that we're looking for. I love to show pictures of the people I work with, because uh, yeah. literally I'd be nobody without these people. Uh, Steve Vogt is uh, probably the guy who's most responsible for uh, modern uh, shell spectrometers. He built the first sort of world-class shell at Lick Observatory in California back in the 80s. And that was a show where we invented our technique uh, and found five of the first six planets, 12 of the first 15 planets. So um, this whole thing with Doppler shifts, maybe it seems a bit esoteric. <laughs> Doppler shifts are involved in everyday life. Uh, these speed guns that, uh, that they use to track baseball pitchers or to the highway patrol uses to, to measure your speed just Doppler shift. These things put out a radio wave of known wavelength. If a car is coming towards them, the light, the, the radio wave that bounces off of it will be Doppler shifted to a shorter wavelength. The change in wavelength tells the officer your speed, and you get written a ticket. So uh, as you can see from this, Doppler shifts can be used for good or evil. So uh, what would the solar system look like if we were alien astronomers with this technique and we were looking back at the sun. Uh, what you would see is the velocity of the sun goes up and down by about plus or minus 10 meters a second. And there uh, is this periodicity about, of about 12 years. And that's the dominant signal. And that's Jupiter. And literally, you, can measure, you know the orbital period of Jupiter just because that's the distance between each of these peaks. And the first order, you can characterize the solar system as consisting of the sun and Jupiter and some garbage. <laughs> it's by far and away the dominant signal. It's more, th more massive than all the other planets combined. I think it's more than twice as massive as all the other planets combined. Uh, so you get the period. That tells you the orbital period. You get how much it goes up and down by. Combining those gets you the mass. And furthermore, the shape of this curve tells you the shape of the orbit. So you notice this is a very smooth S-shaped curve. Uh, scientists will call that a sinusoid. That tells you that the orbit is basically circular. The one other thing you notice on this curve is that the peak is high, then low, then high, then low. That's Saturn. That's the next most dominant planet in our system. Saturn takes 29 years to orbit the sun. Uh, and with our level of technology right now, they're the two planets in our solar system we could detect. Um, I should say detect in quotes. Uh, you need, for in the case of Saturn, 29 years of data. So you start talking about your life expectancy. So prior to uh, the discovery of planets, the only planetary system we knew about was our own. And people have been thinking about this for several hundred years. And basically, the conclusion that everybody had come to, this world's smartest astrophysicist, uh, every Hollywood producer, every science fiction writer, was that all planetary systems would be like our own. You'd have giant planets further out, small rocky planets like us close in, all orbiting their stars in these beautifully nested concentric circles. So the discovery of the first planet was a huge shock. 
This was announced uh, 20 years ago. It'll be 20 years exactly in October. This is 51 peg. Uh, you'll notice here the time is in days, not years. Here's the velocity. And you see the velocity going up and down with a period of about four days. And because of the amplitude, we know this thing is about a half a Jupiter mass. So it's a Jupiter-like planet. Jupiter's about 300 Earth masses. So this is about 150 Earth masses. It's a giant planet, but it takes only four days to orbit its star. Nobody had ever conceived of such a thing before it was discovered. Um, so uh, people thought initially, OK, this, this, is, this just must be wacky. Uh, but it's easy to discover because it's a four-day period. Uh, but the, these things must be very rare. In fact, we now know nearly 1% of stars have planets like this. Um, when it was first announced, nobody believed it because the orbit was so odd, and also because there was this 100-year history of every announced planet being wrong. So uh, we happened to have four nights at Lick Observatory the week after it was announced. Here's our first night, our second night, our third night, and our fourth night. And uh, we went back to Berkeley after we had finished this. And computers were very slow back then. Uh, we'd set this all up on our computers to run. It took about 12 hours. Uh, dead tired, went back to my apartment and crashed. Uh, got back there at midnight, and we saw this, which is exactly what Mayor and Kolo in Switzerland had said. Uh, and we were shocked. We made a little figure of just this data here and put it on, at that time, the brand new World Wide Web. <laughs> and it went around the world the next day, and about three or four days later, we were on the front page of all the newspapers and magazines. And it was really remarkable because, of course, prior to that, you know, I'd basically been a postdoc uh, in a basement. People would slide Cheetos and Diet Coke under the door. Uh, <laughs> and there I was suddenly in all the newspapers and magazines. So one of, the, one of the nifty things about these hot Jupiters is you can put together a diagram that shows the whole system on a single frame, uh, two scales. So uh, 51 Peg is a sun-like star. Uh, its uh, companion is a Jupiter-like planet. Jupiter is about one-tenth the diameter of a sun, so that's about right. And it orbits only 11 stellar diameters, or 11 stellar radii, from the star itself. So everything here is true to scale. Um, that's, you can't do that with the, with the solar system. So uh, one of the earliest planets that we discovered uh, is uh, 16 Sig B. This, uh, the 9,000 stars in the Bright Star Catalog, this is the star that's most like the sun. If you took a spectrum of this star and put it on the sun, you cannot tell the difference. Uh, and like the sun, this thing clearly has a planet. This one's about 800 days. Uh, but you'll notice the shape of this curve is no, no smooth sinusoid. This is more like a sawtooth. That tells you that the shape of this orbit is not circular. And the amplitude giving you the mass, you, this thing is nearly two Jupiter masses. This is, this is a, a bad boy. So if you uh, plot this thing on top of the, the orbit of this thing on top of the solar system, you see just how wacky it is. The four inner planets of the solar system in nice, roughly circular orbits, and then this thing. So if we had one of these things in the solar system, we wouldn't be here. This thing would have gravitationally ejected all the inner planets. Uh, so these systems with these wildly eccentric planets are probably pretty crappy places to look for life. So um, prior to the discovery of planets, uh, it was assumed all planetary systems would look like our own. Uh, after we had found about six or eight planets, we found nothing that looked even remotely like us. We were finding these eccentric planets everywhere. We started routinely finding these hot Jupiters. Um, and so I like to reflect back on this. There's a profound lesson here. Uh, we as humans, we're not really very bright. We're not very imaginative. Uh, and when you try to understand something or extrapolate from a sample of one, you're actually worse off than if you have a sample of zero. You have such tunnel vision, you can't imagine anything else. And I think about that with all the other things in my life, and how many things I, I know and, and believe that must be just absolutely hideously wrong. So uh, this stuff made a huge splash back in the late 90s. And in fact, uh, we announced our first two planets in January of 96, and the first week of February, we made the cover of Time Magazine, uh, which again was just, for us, really bizarre after years and years and years of 
not even really being able to tell people what we were doing. So you, back in those days, you'd make the cover of Time magazine because you'd find a couple of big, easy planets. Big planets are easy because you get big signals. So um, planet hunting is like the spy business. Uh, in both businesses, you want things that are really, really small. The smaller, the better. Uh, people want really small planets uh, because those are the things that you might get life on. Uh, unfortunately, what we've discovered over the uh, 20 years, the subsequent 20 years, is that uh, nature is really cruel and vicious, and that uh, nature packs most of these interesting planets in systems with lots of other planets. So disentangling the signal is very difficult, uh, and you need uh, lots and lots of data to disentangle these teeny tiny little signals. So one of the first oddball planets that we found that illustrates this uh, is this, this is a star, it's a nearby star that's very much like the sun. We've been observing this for years at the Anglo Australian Telescope. Uh, and we saw, you know, we would get, you know, three or four observing runs a year. We'd get maybe three or four observations a year. We would see the thing going up and down uh, by more than our errors, but we didn't know what the hell was going on. Finally, they gave us 48 consecutive nights. This was a huge allocation. And we were able to hit this thing almost every night. You'll notice some nights are missing. That's, again, back to nature being cruel and vicious. We got cloud and rain. That's part of the business. Um, but it wasn't until we got this data set we were able to pull this signal out because there's this four-day signal that's teeny. We're now talking a signal that's only a few meters a second. And there's this longer one-month period. It turns out if you have even more data, you'll see that there's a three-month period in on top of this thing. So this is a really wild system. The four-day period is like a hot Jupiter, except this thing is only about five Earth masses. This is the first of what we now call super-Earths. It's a whole new class of planets that's between about two Earth masses and ten Earth masses. And again, it's a class of planets nobody had ever envisioned. Uh, and then there is a Neptune-mass planet in a one-month orbit and a two-Neptune-mass planet in a three-month orbit. All of, all of these, except for the inner one, are mildly eccentric. Uh, so this is a, another bizarre system that nobody had ever dreamed of. Uh, and yet we now know these systems with uh, super-Earths and Neptune-mass planets with orbital periods of days to a few months are probably the most common type of planetary system there is. About 30% of stars have systems <coughs> like this. So the data I just showed you came from uh, the Anglo-Australian Observatory. Uh, it's way out in the middle of nowhere in Australia, but, but my Australian friends will, will let you know it is not in the outback. The outback's another 100 miles. So um, it's, a, it's a beautiful place. Uh, one of the great joys of this business is you go to these, these beautiful, strange mountaintops, and you get to spend days and weeks there. Uh, there are still really dangerous perils. Uh, they're everywhere. <laughs> there are these giant-tailed rats. <laughs> they're really annoying. They stand so you can see in the background there's the telescope. They stand on the footpath. And at midnight, you'll sometimes want to back, back, walk back to the lodge, get a Diet Coke, get some cookies. They won't get off the path. <laughs> the other real nasty thing about them is that when you're driving there, they want to leap into your car. <laughs> so this business uh, continues to get harder and harder. And the only way to attack it is basically it's twofold. You need to get a lot more observations. Uh, and you need to beat down your measurement errors. And so we've been working very hard on this. Uh, this is an example of another one of these really packed systems. Uh, this is two different data sets. The uh, data set in blue is from the HARPS group, uh, uh, the Swiss uh, Geneva group. And the data in red is from our Keck group. Each one of these data sets is about 120 observations. And that's basically what you need to disentangle these really complex data sets. This thing has a three-day planet, a 5.7-day planet, a 12-day planet, 37, 67, and 433. So this thing is just totally packed. Yeah, there's no more room in the system for planets. And to disentangle the signal just takes hundreds of observations. Uh, the 37-day planet in particular is uh, interesting because uh, the host star in this case is a so-called M-dwarf, one of these red dwarf stars. And these red dwarf stars put out much less energy than the sun. They put out about 1% the energy of the sun. So the so-called habitable zone around these stars is much closer than the sun. So here you've got the sun, 
the planets of the solar system. This thing shaded in blue is the so-called habitable zone. In astronomy, so when you hear habitable zone, you think um, Hawaii and <laughs> waves and maybe some guys bringing you pina coladas out at the edge of the beach. Uh, in astronomy lingo, habitable zone only means that the planet could potentially have water, liquid water on the surface. It's not so close to the star it would necessarily boil off. It's not so far away it would freeze out. That's all astronomers mean by this. And so the habitable zone we know includes Earth, at least we hope it does. Uh, but for these little red dwarf stars, the habitable zone is much closer to the star because the star puts out a lot less energy. So the nifty thing is the closer the planet is to the star, the easier it is to discover. You get more orbital periods in a given amount of time. And also, the closer the planet is to the star, the stronger the gravitational tug the planet has on the star. So this 37-day uh, planet that we found fits comfortably within the potentially habitable zone of this planet, or the star. And these things are now becoming common. Uh, these red dwarfs are now the hottest thing in the business because they're the stars that we can detect potentially habitable planets around right now. So the uh, data that we took for this uh, thing was uh, at Keck. Keck is the world's biggest telescope. Uh, it's on the hopefully extinct volcano of Mauna Kea on the big island of Hawaii. Um, it used to be I'd get off the airplane there at Kona, uh, and it would be some beautiful Hawaiian day. The ocean is like 50 feet away. And you'd hear all the tourists getting off the plane going, I can't wait till I'm in my swimsuit and out swimming. And uh, I'd get in a rental car and go up to 14,000 feet and freeze my ass off. And at that altitude, uh, you're always sick. And they have posters in all the, all the rooms uh, with altitude sickness. And you'd read down the symptoms and you'd go, yep, I got that one, I got that one, I got that one. And you'd wonder, uh, is this par for the course? Or should I go seek medical attention? So uh, we were really happy when they finally set up remote observing from the beautiful uh, Hawaiian town of Waimea. More recently, we've uh, started a major planet search uh, at Carnegie's uh, Magellan Telescopes at the Carnegie Observatory of Las Campanas in Chile. This is a beautiful site uh, in the, uh, uh, the, the nice part of the Atacama, the southern part. The northern part is where it hasn't rained in 400 years. Uh, here it rains, you get some scrub here, you get wild burrows wandering around, you get uh, uh, lizards. Um, this is a beautiful trek about a mile and a half from the Magellan telescopes to the older telescopes. And I'll sometimes do that in the afternoon, although it can be a bit scary. Uh, vultures circle me the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> what makes this so special, uh, first of all, it's an extraordinary observing site. It's probably the best natural seeing site uh, on the planet. Uh, but this was the first project that I've been involved with where we were able to build a custom-made spectrometer to do nothing but precision velocity work. Up until uh, this point, uh, I had always worked on general purpose of shells. And so a general purpose of shell, every astronomer comes in, they move the gratings, they change the focus, they this and that. Uh, and this spectrometer has no flexibility. So uh, this is the spectrometer right here. It's, uh, the footprint is about the size of a ping pong table. Uh, the light makes a double pass. I, I won't make you go through all the technical <coughs> details. But you'll see that there's this thick wall here, like four inches of styrofoam. So they took the wall off this end so that you could see inside of it. But normally there's a wall here too. The whole thing is encased within four inches of styrofoam. There's a heating element on the inside. Because this observatory is at 8,000 feet, uh, it doesn't get hot, even though you're in the desert. So if you heat this thing to 27 degrees centigrade, uh, it's warmer than the surrounding environment. And we can maintain the temperature super precisely to about plus or minus one one hundredth of a degree. And there are no free parameters in the spectrograph. You cannot fix or change anything. It's super stable. Uh, and as a result, we're getting much better data. I'll show you an example in just a moment. But first, I want to show you the two guys who uh, really deserve responsibility for building this thing. This, this photo was taken in, so we're Carnegie DTM. Another Carnegie department is the Carnegie Observatories in Pasadena, and I work very closely with the people there, our sister institution. Uh, and this is the, uh, the laboratory uh, at the Carnegie Observatories, and this is Steve Sheckman, who was just inducted into the National Academy uh, just a few weeks ago, and this is Jeff Crane. 
Steve did the initial design for this new spectrometer, the PFS, the Planet Finding Spectrometer. And Jeff did all the final design and also built the thing, uh, which is amazing. And this was in the lab just a few weeks before it was sent to Ch Chile. And uh, we wanted to get some light into the spectrometer so that I could begin working on the software for the data reduction. So uh, Steve sits here with a mirror, and he takes sunlight from the window, and he bounces it into the spectrometer. And I'd love to show this picture because it shows that like, when you become a high enough guru in this business, you can actually become one with the spectrometer. <laughs> so I mentioned uh, it's a little bit scary to wander around at Las Campanas. You can see uh, what happened to one of the previous astronomers here. <laughs> so this is uh, what this new spectrometer is buying us. Uh, the, these green points are from the Anglo-Australian Telescope, uh, and this is uh, around one of these faint red dwarf stars. And the Anglo-Australian uh, Telescope has been observing this thing for 15 years. And in 2009, we announced this planet. So it's kind of ratty, but it goes up and down, uh, and it was a solid detection. Uh, and it's a nine-year orbital period, and it was a Jupiter-like planet around an uh, M dwarf in a long period. It was the first one ever discovered, so we were kind of happy about that. Um, but this spectrometer is old school. It's not stabilized. Everybody tweaks it and adjusts it, and so these are the errors. It is what it is. Uh, with these new generation of spectrometers, you can see how teeny the error bars are. They literally are no bigger than the points themselves. The red data is from HARPS. The blue data is from uh, PFS, our, our spectrometer in Chile. And you now beautifully trace out uh, the curve that was first found by the Anglo-Australian Telescope. But now you can look for residuals in the data. So not only is there this nine-year planet, but there is this hidden planet with 33 days. It's only a few meters that we're able to find with this new data set because it's so dramatically better. Uh, it turns out almost every, every star with known planets has got more planets. And if you just have enough precision, you could pull it out. And in this case, because it's an M dwarf and the period's about 33 days, this also is in the potentially habitable zone of this star. So these things are becoming relatively common. So I, I just thought, uh, I'm getting towards the end of the talk, and I just thought I'd give you a sense of, of what my life is like. Uh, I'm kind of an itinerant astronomer. Uh, as everybody will tell you, I'm here about half the year, and the rest of the time I'm gone. Uh, so uh, here we are in DC, and I'm going to California a lot to observe. I'm going to Hawaii. There's the Anglo-Australian Telescope. There's the Carnegie uh, Magellan Telescope. So I do this, this big, funny-shaped curve. And if you're doing that funny-shaped curve, Living in D.C. is just about the worst place to be. But, uh, you know, the airlines love me almost as much as I hate them. Uh, so finding planets this way is really nifty. But let's be real. What everybody wants to do is to see a planet. And uh, NASA has plans, hopefully starting in the 2030s, as does the European Space Agency, to launch something. This is an idea that people had in the uh, uh, 10 years ago. Uh, and in this case, you've got four giant telescopes in space. Uh, and they're bringing the light together to a combiner. Uh, and they're actually bringing the light in and out of phase. So the light cancels itself. Uh, the problem with trying to find a planet is that it's overcome by the brightness of a star. But with this so-called interferometer, you actually can use the star's light to destroy itself and then you get these bands where you might hope to see the planet directly. So the sort of images you're going to get with these things, hopefully it'll happen in my lifetime, uh, it's going to be single pixel images. You're not going to see, you know, beaches and espresso bars. And, um, but it's really exciting because once you can get an image of a planet, you can take that light and put it into a spectrometer. Just as we take spectra of stars, we can take spectra of planets. And if you saw things like uh, the, the spectral signature of oxygen and of water uh, and of methane, things like that, uh, you would really have flipped the question of, is there life out there? Uh, that, those sort of things wouldn't prove that there was life, but they would still flip the question that people would have to argue why there isn't life. Uh, so hopefully that's the general direction we're headed. Um, I like to sort of. Uh, wrap things up a little bit by going back to the Drake equation. 
Uh, the Drake equation is often called the second most famous equation uh, of the last century. Um, and uh, in this, uh, Frank Drake, who started the very first SETI program, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, he was trying to estimate uh, how many communicating intelligences there are in our own galaxy. And so the way you play this game is you just take each one of these terms, I won't read them all out to you, but you just take each one of these terms and multiply them by each other, and that tells you the number of communicating civilizations. So when Frank first came up with this in the early 60s, the only thing that was known was the rate of, uh, of good stars, the rate of formation of suitable stars. And when we came into this business in the 80s, that's the same thing. It's the only thing that we knew. We didn't know anything else. We didn't even know if there were any other planets. So uh, to give you a sense of just what an incredible leap we've made in the last 20 years, we now know the next two terms in this equation. The fraction of stars that have planets is pretty close to 100%. Virtually every star, so there might be a few oddball cases, but virtually every star has planets. The next term is the number of, of Earth-like uh, planets or planets that, uh, that uh, might be habitable around each star. We now know roughly that number. It's something like about 30%. There is a lot of planets out there that could potentially host life. Um, the next big number is the fraction of planets where life develops. This is something we could begin to address if we could take spectra of planets and we could look for <coughs> life signatures like water. Uh, and like something really out of thermodynamic balance, like oxygen. Uh, so these are the sorts of questions that maybe the young people here might address when they're in grad school or when they're working in their career. So I, I, I'd like to put this in just as a joke. Um, you know, the Drake equation only addresses the, uh, the number of, of communicating civilizations in our own galaxy. But of course, <laughs> there are a lot of galaxies out there. Uh, wouldn't it be wild if on average at any given time there's maybe one communicating civilization for every two galaxies? Uh, that would mean that the universe is full of communicating civilizations. It would be you know, countless millions of them. But if you're in different galaxies, you'll never know about each other. There, there could be all these island intelligences and we're all just kind of stranded. So uh, we started off by seeing how Literally, the origin of science leads to the question of extrasolar planets. And now, after 400 years, we've sort of completed the revolution. Now we have extrasolar planets. And we're left to the next biggest questions, questions that Bruno was speculating about more than 400 years ago. Uh, and you know, like I mentioned before, when, when we started in this business, uh, you couldn't tell people what you were doing. Uh, and now the last two uh, decadal uh, surveys of astrophysics uh, have proclaimed in 2000 the discovery of extrasolar planets in the past decade was one of the most remarkable achievements of the century and the culmination of centuries of speculation. And the most recent decadal review uh, notes that extrasolar planets are one of the three pillars of modern astrophysics uh, and that the foremost goal of extrasolar research for the next decade is the discovery of a nearby habitable planet. Uh, so this is a, it's kind of a wild time to, to have been in. And uh, I've been doing the exact same thing for 30 years. And assuming Rick doesn't fire me, I'd like to do it as long as they don't kick me out the door. So uh, thank you very much. I'm sure Paul will be happy to take some questions. Bob? So the Drake equation predicts millions of intelligent, communicative civilizations out there. Why don't any of them want to talk to us? So the Drake equation itself doesn't predict that. People who put parameters into the Drake equation predict that. Uh, I've done the Drake equation, and I come up with one communicating civilization for two galaxies. The thing is that those parameters, you know, especially back in the 60s, were totally unknown except for the first parameter. And optimistic people put in optimistic parameters. Pessimistic people put in pessimistic parameters. Uh, you know, I believe in empirical data. and. Uh, you know, with the exception now of the first three numbers, uh, these things are totally unknown. The scariest of, of those uh, terms, let me just go back there, everybody should be frightened a little bit, is the final one, lifetime of communicating civilizations. So um, by the Drake uh, definition of intelligence, human beings have been intelligent for about 100 years. 
Uh, it was only 100 years ago that we developed radio, giving us the ability to possibly communicate across stellar distances. So you could have a civilization that's full of Chaucer's and Shakespeare's and, and gorgeous artists and, and, and so on. They're not intelligent until they have the technology to communicate across civilizations. So we've lived about 100 years. Uh, there's, you know, we'd like to think we're going to live for thousands and millions of more years, uh, but there's no guarantee. There's lots of ways we could blow ourselves up. Uh, and if that happens, and if this final number is quite small, then the chance of communicating civilizations is really very small. 100 light years is very small compared to the distance across the galaxy. Like and that's as far out as we've communicated so far, sure. so. A question here? Me? Yeah, you. Uh, you mentioned uh, just the innate limitations <clears throat> on human intelligence. And I'm just wondering, do you scientists have any techniques to try to open up the blinders a little more than we would do naturally? Yeah, so, um, you know, hopefully that's what science is all about, right? I mean, the blinders before science were that we lived in the center of the universe. So scientists certainly opened up those blinders. But, you know, scientists are human, and we have our own blinders. Uh, you know, uh, every one of the people here at DTM thinks they're doing the best research in the world. Uh, and, uh, that's you know, true, of course. Yes. Uh, so, you know, you do the best you can, but, uh, you know, scientists themselves get shaken up. You know, when quantum mechanics was invented 100 years ago, none of the old physicists believed it. And quantum mechanics really couldn't progress to the point where you have semiconductors uh, until basically the old scientists died off. So uh, maybe that's the one good thing about death. <laughs> Yeah, I'm glad you put the Drake equation up because it turns out that the uh, Frank Drake launched his first search for SETI, uh, Project Osmo, a little over 50 years ago using a telescope at Green Bank that was designed by a DTM staff member, Howard Tail. In fact, Howard Tail's son is here tonight, Judge uh, David Tail, with his wife. So I mean, it's really appropriate to have SETI. <laughs> That would be tough because you would have to be able to chemically rule out that the, they'd be naturally occurring. Um, so that would be a rough one. One of the nice things about free oxygen is it shouldn't exist. Uh, if, if you got rid of life, the oxygen would react with the rocks and be gone in a few hundred years. So uh, if you're looking for life, you're looking for something that's wildly out of thermodynamic equilibrium. Uh, other things are tougher because there's, you know, there, there's so many different planets, there's so many different ways you can make planets that it's hard to, to predict what could be naturally occurring. Uh, go ahead. How do you decide what you'll go after next? Yeah, so for us it's really very simple. Uh, I took a slide out of here that uh, would be, I wish I had it to show you right now. So, you know, the galaxy is a big place. A galaxy, is, you know, the, the part of the galaxy that has stars is something like about 100,000 light years across. Uh, so planets are really plentiful. Almost every star has planets. So we go after the nearest ones. Uh, go for the low-lying fruit. We also go after the nearest ones because the ability to image a planet diminishes with the distance of the star. So we, we consider our work to be sort of uh, the precursor to the next generation, which will be direct imaging, and that will only ever happen around the nearest stars. So we, we've got about 20 or 30 light years. There's one in the back, yeah, in the corner. Uh, most stars have planets, maybe all stars have planets. What's the science behind that? So forming a star is a big, messy pro process. And that's a whole other lecture that would take way too long. But stars are formed by a collapse of a giant cloud of gas and dust. And it's a messy process. And there's a lot of stuff left over. There's so much left over stuff we now know it's almost impossible not to form planets. Oh, oh, it's, 
perf yeah, perfectly stable. Um, uh, you know, it's just it's just Newtonian physics, just Kepler's laws. Uh, being close to the stars is not a problem. Um, what what for me is so fun is that they were totally unpredicted, and that initially they really flustered the theorists. And there's nothing an observer likes better than, than flustering a theorist. <laughs> <laughs> so, question in the back there. Yeah. Yeah, so um, this again is something that, that people really haven't thought about 30 or 40 years ago. But we now know that some of the giant moons orbiting uh, Saturn and, and Jupiter and so on, that, uh, that they appear to have liquid oceans underneath their surface. So the question is, where do they get their energy? How do you, why don't they freeze out? And the answer is that they're tidally heated from the giant planet they orbit. So this is a source of energy that really people hadn't considered a generation or two ago. This is another example of, you know, tunnel vision, uh, and, uh, and you know, we're making small progress, but, you know, finding those sorts of things around other stars really is, is beyond our comprehension right now. So we stick with the sort of the classical habitable zone. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Paul. Based on your research, where does the research at Sun Rock <laughs> This is my friend Tom Porter. He's one of the the form, foremost known uh, jazz experts in the district. And uh, Sun Ra maintained that he was from Saturn. Um, <laughs> and if you, uh, if you listen to his music, you probably would believe that too. He has rings in his head. Yeah, question here. Uh, if you uh, do find, say, a communicating civilization, say, 100 light years away, That means a simple conversation would take 200 years. Yes. So that any communication with them would be would take generations. Is that right? Yes. It would be. A, it's a very daunting thing when your life expectancy is 60 or 70 or 80 years. <coughs> Space is a big place. That's great. Uh, Paul, I'm sure, will be uh, uh, interested in answering some questions if you come down uh, here. Before we thank him again, I'd like to point out this is the last of the neighborhood lectures for the season, but we'll pick up again in fall. We have two in fall, one from our department and the other department of campus geophysical laboratory. So we have two in fall and two again uh, next spring. So I hope you enjoy them. If you like these, sign up uh, and you'll get our announcements for uh, when the next season starts. So let's thank Paul again.